Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Eccentric, the makers of the K-Box and the new K-Pulley. Guys, flywheel training's really grown in popularity of late, and although it's something that's been around for a while, the simple reason that it's grown in popularity is because it works. We've been lucky to have a K-Box in our weight room for the past three years, and we've seen some really great things when it comes to improving the athlete's ability to change direction, and then looking at our return to play protocols with different lower body injuries with the student athletes. The love-hate relationship that everyone has with the K-Box is now just going to grow more with the addition of the K-Pulley. The ability to do standing presses, pulls, rip-throughs, and knee drive exercises is just going to be another arsenal to our training and another addition to the love-hate relationship that our student-athletes have with the awesome tools that come from Eccentric. Go ahead and hop over to Eccentric.com today to check out what they have. Guys, I can't recommend it enough, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed not just with the products, but with the awesome customer service that Eccentric provides. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content that it provides, make sure you hop over and check out the all-new Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is the combination of the CVA SPS community and the Rugby Strength Coach community, bringing you what is sure to be the Internet's leading resource for continuing education for strength and conditioning professionals. Combining these two resources has allowed us to bring some of the best content from some of the best minds in the world together for your one-stop shop to better improve the continuing education for not just yourself, but your entire staff. Bringing together all of the lectures from the Rugby Strength Coach community, along with the lectures exclusively done for the Central Virginia Sport Performance community, and all the lectures performed at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar, make this an absolute must for performance coaches around the world. The world-class lectures at the Strength Coach Network are not all that you'll see as well. The discussion in the forums and the support and the career guidance from some of the top practitioners in the world, from people all over the world, makes this an absolute must and a great place for you to network, learn, and grow as a performance professional. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS, that's C-V-A-S-P-S, to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. We're sure you're going to find great value in the Strength Coach Network and are really excited to have you involved. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS to check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely awesome talk with the head of human performance for Innos Team UK, Ben Williams. Guys, Ben is going to start right in giving us his background and how his work going from the British Army all the way through the ranks has brought him into Team Innos UK. We're also going to start talking about, you know, guys, the position that he's in and how it's unique because looking at the human performance side of sailing versus the actual technical side with the actual boat and how those two work together. We then get into like what drives his decision making and how he needs to like step back and look at specific things in order to drive the program in specific directions. And then we finish off talking about the importance of flexibility and programming and how when you're dealing with a sport that's just completely dictated by the weather, how at times your entire programming model turns from actual development to just being able to come back and recover for tomorrow. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Ben, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Hey, how you doing, mate? You good? Yeah. It was a man. pleasure. Very I'm, excited to be on. I'm excited for this, too. We were just talking about some stuff off camera, and I'm really rip-roaring and ready to go to get this started, but for the, the person and a half who doesn't know who you are, let, let's let people know who Ben is, where you're at, what you're doing, and, and kind of how you got there. Okay. Well, for the 99% of the sports science world that doesn't know who I am. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my name is Ben Williams. I am the head of human performance for Ineos Team UK. We are the British challenger for the America's Cup, and the America's Cup is the oldest trophy in international sport and it's uh, in the sport of sailing um, it's very much a technological sport so like formula one a lot of the winning and losing depends on the technology of the vessel um, but our vessel is completely powered by humans so we've got guys driving it guys flying it because unlike a normal boat it comes out of the water on aquafoils to create less drag 
Um, so, you know, the boat's going like 60, 65 miles an hour. Um, but then all of the appendages that drive that are driven by hydraulic systems, like a, a bit like a JCB. But unlike a JCB with an engine, the guys drive hydraulic pistons, which so it's all human powered, basically. Um, so we have a, a physiological um, element to what we do. We have a huge availability element to what we do. And we have a uh, um, obviously the, the, the drive of the technology, which is driven by the humans. So it's a really interesting sport. Um, before here, I was with motorsport. I worked with a, a young driver called Dean Stoneman. He and he rose up through all the different elements from British um, Formula Renault up to being a Red Bull driver in GP2, GP3, and he ended up in the States uh, doing Indy Indy Lights, winning three to one hundred few bits and pieces. So that was a nice journey. You know, that was five or six years of of working one on one um, with a with a driver. Um, it taught me a lot about um the holistic nature of what we do and the people first um and i think that was nice because it took me away from some very serious technical models which i'd you know i spent a lot of time working on those as a younger coach um, and working one-on-one -on -one with an athlete really taught me a lot about the athlete first the holistic nature of what we do and how we get our ideas across to them um you know how they buy into those ideas and how we can transfer them more effectively by having better relationships. Um, before that, I, you know, I was the typical young coach. I bounced around from triathlon, judo, uh, bit of field sport, uh, did an internship in rugby. Um, uh, and then before that, I was uh, with the British, British Army. Um, so that, you know, I joined the British Army at 16 years old. And that's where my passion for, for health and fitness kind of was driven. Um, so it, not, the te not the usual model of, you know, undergraduate degree, bit of work experience, maybe a postgraduate degree and then into full time. You know, I had, to, I had to kind of muscle my way in through the rough road. You know, I had to go to all of the interviews where I didn't have a degree and try and sell myself a little bit more. Um, and I got a bit lucky as well sometimes. I worked hard enough to put myself in the right place where luck could find me. You know, working with a lot of different athletes in an area got me with the, the motorsport guy. And that led to, you know, some good work with him. Working with some combat athletes led me to, to working with a, um, a lady who was a, a Masters World Champion. Um, and that kind of opened up some doors, some junior pathways. And then the gym that she was at had a, a lawn tennis association junior pathway. So I picked up some work with um, LTAD stuff with the kids. So it gave me a real big variety being in the right place at the right time um, from a few different elements. But uh, kind of that led me to having a re relatively good reputation in the local area and then picked up some work in sailing with around the world um, stuff. So Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing, I, I, I went in as an assistant coach for a guy called Pete Cunningham, who was a bit of a mentor to me. Um, he's now with the Singapore Institute of Sport as a performance director. Uh, he was he was huge for me. He taught me a lot about um, some of the technical models that I wouldn't that I didn't know hugely about because I didn't do my undergraduate. Um, so he he really filled in a lot of gaps for me, um, and that's kind of where that excitement for for the technical elements came in working with him. Um, and then that, you know, that led me to have a bit of a reputation that somebody asked me to to do some work with with Ben Ains, Sir Ben Ainsley in 2014, which led to me starting that role as head of strength conditioning and at the end of the last campaign, promoted to head of human performance. So, um, yeah, a bit of a whirlwind kind of story. Um, I'm currently doing my master's at the University of Portsmouth, finally got on the education train. Um, it, that was one of those things that initially started that I wanted to I wanted to prove to other people in the community that I, even though I I have a role that would generally command uh, an undergraduate degree as a minimum that I I'm more than capable of doing that um, and that's turned into slightly different I actually don't care about that now it's more about I've got a lot of passion for that learning and I'm more excited about the project that I'm doing than ending up with the letters after my name um, and it didn't start off like I have to be honest. At one point, I was chasing the paper, and now I'm chasing the uh, 
the enjoyment of, of learning. So that's awesome, man. And it is, it sounds like it's been a, a very random almost course going through all of these things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been very lucky that I've worked with maybe seven or eight different sports now. Um, and off the back of those seven or eight different sports, I've worked with everything from seven or eight year old kids up to masters, um, you know, judokas. So I've been very, uh, I've been very lucky. I've worked with a lot of populations. I've worked with some really good coaches. I've been able to learn from a lot of good people. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been in the right place at the right time to pick up some really nice roles. So, um, I think it's given me a lot of experience across multiple, um, multiple elements of, of the areas in which we work in sports science. So um, I, feel, I feel quite lucky to be a relatively young practitioner with, I would say, quite a lot of experience. But, um, you know, I'm not saying it's the most. There's plenty of people out there with more experience, you know, more qualifications and more understanding of what we do than I do. But, you know, I'm still learning and I'm, I'm still giving as much as I can. So, yeah, and you're in a situation right now where you're, you're kind of overseeing every like angle of the training like spectacle. So let's talk about some of the challenges with that. Let's talk about you know some of the goals you have with that and what your kind of methods and theories are to how to manage and, and build those those different silos, if you may. Yeah, so I guess if we look at what I do now, um, I'm head of human performance. Um, we call it human performance here um, because uh, the, there are multiple elements to what we do. You know, we have technology performance, we have engineering performance, which is systems, the systems of the boat. So um, that's the reason we have the, the human bit. Out, you know, there are other people out there that are saying it's just performance, but in our in our world. I couldn't be head of performance because I'd be a director of this organization. Um, so it is the genuinely human element that I look after. And, you know, we've got two squads. We've got a first team squad and we've got an academy squad and we call our academies the, the rebels. Um, so because of the amount of people we've got, you know, circa 30 guys, um, we, you know, we need multiple practitioners. So, um, there's myself, I've got um, two consult three consultant physiotherapists, um, I've got four consultant soft tissue therapists, uh, I've got a couple of strength and conditioning coaches and um, two nutritionists, uh, performance chef and um, I think that's about it, oh and two consultant general practitioners, doctors. So um, we do use a lot of consultants. Um, we, we find it it's good to have guys here focused rather than um, maybe here not doing stuff for periods of time, especially if we're in different elements of our workload with maybe developing the boat rather than developing the athletes as much. Um, but you know it's quite a big it's quite a big group of people. Um, and we one of the things I guess it's my job to do is make sure all of that works effectively. Um, and I, and I see that as my primary role, because if those elements aren't working effectively, then I've already failed before any of my technical ability is inputted into the, into the team. So um, I guess, how do we do that? Well, that's been my biggest learning curve since, since accepting this role and having a bit more responsibility in terms of people, budget, um, time, overview, um, strategy. So... The first thing I, I look at is, you know, what do our technical models look like? Now, I truly believe that it's not my responsibility necessarily to, to drive those technical models. I've got younger coaches that I want them to develop those, those areas and I want them to have the passion to be up to date with, um, you know, the current literature, the current technology to measure or analyze these um, you know, factors of our training, whether it be velocity-based training or um, monitoring wellness or um, monitoring uh, blood markers for our nutritionists or any of those things. So although we have got technical models and we've got quite a, you know, a heavily evidence-based platform, 
it's the junior, it's not the junior coaches, it's the, it's the areas, it's those individual areas and the people that drive those that are my interest. So are my strength and conditioning coaches, are they driving the technical models in the gym? Do we have good data for blood markers that are informing our, um, our nutrition protocols? Best practice is great, but you know, we've got the time and we've got the um, financial support to do blood markers. So if every if we can do that with every athlete, then every athlete gets a better, um, you know, a better platform from which to launch their athletic ability from. So I guess what I guess to wrap it up is if we were to look at your career as a pyramid, you know, when you're at the bottom, um, and I'm not saying I'm at the top, you know, I'm nowhere near there, but if you're at the bottom, you're really interested in those technical models. If you're a nutritionist, you want to know what all the current literature best practice looks like. If you're a strength conditioning coach, you want to know that you know all of the, you know, the basics. What does your, what does your, the transfer of your program look like? What does your periodization look like? Have you periodized recovery? Have you taken into account scheduling? Um, what does the technical areas look like? Do, do the lifts represent structural integrity? Um, for transferring to the sport, can you develop speed, power, awareness, stability? You know, what have you done your needs analysis? So all of those areas are really important to us. Um, and as you step forward, I think your skills need to become softer and more strategic. So I guess the area that I'm developing my skills now would be are my coaches operating at their maximum potential? Because if I try to put all my effort into my athletes, I'm going to miss so many areas because I've got all these subject matter experts around me and I'd be silly to think that I'm a, you know, I know more about blood profiling than Aidan Goggins. I'd be silly to think that I know more about soft tissue, even though I am a soft tissue therapist and I have been for a long time. I'd be silly to think I know more about current soft tissue than the guys who we send on CPD courses every month. So my job is to make sure that first of all, all of those coaches are passionate and up to date, but also that they're really enjoying their work. Um, so my day to day stuff is a bit like when you're younger and you're on the shop floor and you're like, you know, Hey buddy, how many hours do you sleep? I saw an athlete monitoring that you're feeling a bit sore today. You know, have you got, is it, is that just soreness or have you got a niggle or, you know, how's things at home? How's your training going? Is there anything you don't understand? You know, you're having those conversations on a day-to-day -day basis with your athletes. And I guess I'm doing that now with my coaches. And that's quite a nice thing because I think if they're in really good shape and in a good place um, and they feel supported and they feel they have autonomy to make their own decisions, then they can drive their element of our program more effectively and more effectively than I can do on a micro level. So um, I'm working on those holistic skills quite heavily at the moment. And trying to develop a really good personal development model, development model for all elements of the guys we've got working for us. You know, so our doctors, I don't know anywhere near, you know, I'm, I'm not a general practitioner and I haven't been through 10 years of, of study, but can I help them understand sports transfer more? You know, can we send them on a UK SCA course for programming to understand what we're doing? Um, can we get them to buy into that, that they understand maybe that some of the work they do in health transfers directly into availability, availability to us transfers directly into a fast boat, and that might make us win the America's Cup. So um, I'm always looking for the next thing in my skills to enable, what I'm trying to do is enable all of the guys in my team to be the best they can be. I'm trying to be an enabler. And, and of course, in a positive sense. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to make sure that God, I want to make sure that it, it's getting too hard to keep my coaches. You know, they want to move on. That, that's where I want my coaches. I want them banging on my door saying, Hey, you know, this is too easy for me. I've, I, um, I need to move on. I need to go somewhere where I'm doing your job. You know, that's kind of, that's where I want my coaches. I don't want them. I don't want them boxed i don't want them doing it i don't want them to be a product of me i want them to be a product of them that challenges me every day that's what i'm looking for you know can they challenge me every day will my cv be on their desk in five years time i really hope so because if that's the case then i've done a really good job yeah dude that's awesome so now we were talking about something a little bit beforehand too and that is 
decision making and, and what drives decisions and kind of how you you balance that in, in a sense. Um, let let's talk about that a little bit because I think that that's something that a lot of people. Um, unfortunately decide that they're going to be on one side of this fence than the other. Yeah, I think, I think I've, I've been, I think I've been down many roads in decision-making. Um, I read an interesting book recently called, um, what got you here won't get you there. And I guess a very simple summary of that is you could have a really good program that's very successful so I could take my, you know, previous racing driver. He he won a lot of races. He got a Red Bull sponsorship. He was in really good shape. Everybody wanted him. He was a very aggressive driver. And the things we were doing with him physically kept him available. You know, he was always available to drive the car. He always felt like he was strong enough. His braking and acceleration um, strengths were, were really good. He never got arm pump. Um, he never got neck ache, you know, from a... From a driving a car point of view, the program worked. Um, and then I got asked to do a bit of consultancy with another driver um, while I was working with Dean. And we implemented the same program and it didn't work. So coming back to my book, having a really good model that you think works might not work somewhere else. And I think that really affects your decision making. And you need to understand that no matter what your technical knowledge is, and no matter what you've done before that works, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work again. And sometimes you have to find something that's completely different. And if we were to look at my current squad now, my oldest guy's 46 years old and my youngest guy's 18. So I might have a really good technical model for one guy and all of his markers, blood markers could look great. Inflammation, low, you know, available hormone, testosterone, really good. You know, he, we could throw everything at him and it'll stick and he'll progress really quickly. If I was to take that same model and give it to my 46-year-old guy, it's just not going to work. He's going to overreach. We're going to overload him. He's going to be subject to injury. You know, maybe his health mark is going to go through the floor and he might be in, uh, in an overreaching area. So my decision-making over the last couple of years has become much more, um, it depends and that doesn't mean I'm sitting on the fence. I'm happy to make a decision based on the information in front of me. And I'm happy to lie, you know, lay on my sword and that be my decision. But the first thing is I look at the information. I look at the individual. I look at what's relevant. You know, we could have two guys exactly the same producing the same numbers, but one of them's a single guy and one of them's got a wife and two kids and he's moving house and putting an extension on and he gets half the sleep the other guy gets. Can they do the same things? I don't think they can. You know, maybe they can do for a little while, but eventually that lack of sleep or that stress is going to catch up with that second guy. So um, I think everything's in context. And, you, you know, it, we're, we're all a product of kind of what we see and do and who we spend time with and the things we enjoy learning about. One of the big things in um, you'll notice and we all do in, in sports science and strength conditioning is, you know, everybody has their opinion on social media and these sort of bits and pieces. But... I think some of the smartest guys out there, they always have the same answer, which is, well, this is in context to actually what's happening. Nobody knows what's happening underneath that guy's roof or in that guy's house. It's all contextual to what's going on with those athletes, with those practitioners and with the markers that they see. And that's what drives my decision making. It doesn't matter what the technical model says. If it doesn't add up with the individual, then we don't do it. If something new comes out, do we trial it? Yeah, of course we trial it. You know, when we're absolute, we're a, we work in an innovation sport. Everything we do is about innovation, velocity-based training. Um, you know, we use it, we apply it where it's relevant, and we research it as much as we can, and we try and integrate it into our program where it's useful. Do I give it to my 46-year-old guy who's been bench pressing for 30 years? Sometimes, but not very often, because he has a way that he does his strength sessions. He's really happy with that. And to get him to buy into it, the way that we deliver his strength training needs to be applicable to the way he's done it for most of his life. Whereas with an 18-year-old, it's brand new. He's really interested in what makes him better. How does he catch up to these guys that have been in 20 years? He'll take every piece of information you can throw at him, and he'll absorb it. He'll study it, and he'll apply it. So... 
we pick and choose our battles and when they're relevant to individuals we really push them and when they're less so then we let nature take it take its course and you know we have an holistic overview here where what's right for individual athlete is what's right for them and we don't push things that don't need to be pushed uh, unless it's essential to their development or to their recovery or to their holistic health and i think that's a really interesting thing you know i think people have to remember that no matter what information's out there it's the human that makes the difference it's the way that you portray the information it's the way that they absorb it it's the way that they want to undertake that program um, you know the best and you hear it all the time you know the absolute best programs in the world delivered poorly will yield poor results and the poorest programs in the world delivered with an exceptional nature will yield good results and what we're trying to do here is take all of the technology information evidence um, based practice practice based, we're trying to take everything we can and we're trying to deliver it to individuals based on what we think will work for them on a day-to-day -day basis, month to month, year to year, campaign to campaign. How do we get the best out of an individual based on the information that we have and based on that their personality and the way they're going to absorb it? I love that. That's, that's sensational. Now, when we look at the type of athlete that you are with now, um, how is some of that unique? Because this situation that you're in, um, the vessel is all you know just as important as the driver. Yeah. So we we have a we have a funny athlete really. So first of all, we've got two populations of athlete. We have an afterguard and we have a grinding population. So the afterguard are our technical guys, like. Sir Ben Ainsley, Giles Scott, Ian Jensen, Xavi Fernandez, like these multiple Olympians, you know, the, the guys I've just mentioned have got quite a few gold medals to their name. Um, these are the guys that have, they know how to develop a boat. They've spent multiple years developing a campaign where everything is important, the physicality, the boat, the sail trim, um, the finish on the paint, all of these things were, were relevant to how they won their their world championships, Olympic games, all these sort of things. Um, and these are the guys that will inevitably do the tactics. They will drive the boat. They'll fly the boat. So we have a pilot on board. We have a helmsman. We have a, a wing trimmer. So our, the sails on our boat look more like a, an airplane wing than, a, than they do a, a sail on a boat. Like it's, um, if you were to attach it onto the side of an airplane, you, you wouldn't see too much difference. You know, it, it works the same way. It develops lift, um, which gives us our speed. And then the aquafoils, a bit like a plane wing uh, on the other side. If you, if you can imagine an aeroplane on its side with one wing in the water and one wing up, that's kind of what our boat looks like. Um, the whole boat comes out of the water. So the first job is we need to develop a fast boat. And the way we do that is by our athletes being available. So if you were to ask me what my mantra is, my athletes, the first thing is, are they available to go sailing? To develop the boat because if they're not available and they can't go sailing, the boat doesn't get developed and we don't progress our technology and intellectual property so um that's our, my my first port of call I'm, I'm quite happy to have an athlete that can't that isn't the best athlete on the team but if he can go out sail every single day and develop the boat then i've partly done my job because he's not ill he's not injured and he's available for his technical knowledge to be imparted onto the the technical team you know the designers the systems engineers his feet it's a bit like a racing driver you know you can give him the fastest car but unless he can attach his ass to the car and his hands to the wheel and get it right then it doesn't matter what the car's doing um, and, and it's a bit the same with us we can't develop the boat unless the athletes are available to sail now part of sailing the boat is sometimes they got to do it you know we're subject to the wind <laughs> and the, the conditions on the water so unlike football or um, rugby or hockey or you know a multitude of other sports where you can say okay we're going to train on tuesday wednesday thursday we're going to recover on friday we're going to play on saturday you know i i don't i don't um i don't know what the each individual team's technical models are for the way they recover and train in between games but they do have a nice they have foresight essentially of what their what their program will look like well, and we don't so 
I'm essentially programming for in two weeks time, my guys could increase their load by 500% because we've had 10 days of good weather and they want to sail for six hours a day to develop the boat. So I've got these guys that are mentally fatigued from being the afterguard. And then I've got these guys that power the boat with their upper body. So the grinders on the boat, they turn a, a hand cycle, which drives a piston, which turn pushes hydraulic fluid through, through a, a system. And that moves the appendages of the boat. So they're a bit like cyclists, but with their arms. Um, and for anybody who's been cycling, if you go and cycle for six hours a day, you're pretty tired. Um, and if we're developing a boat and we want to sail for six hours a day, then these guys are moving the handles for six hours a day. And that's just the way it is. Um, it's not like we can go and say, hey, design team, um, you can have 45 minutes today with the guys because that works for my periodized plan. Because they'll just say, well, OK, we're not going to win the America's Cup then. Well, you know, they want six hours of design development and they get six hours of design development. So I have to have a very robust athlete. Um, especially in terms of the grinders. I have to have an athlete that can change their loading schemes very quickly. So we have to keep their load inherently high, just so if a good weather window of 10 days comes along and they want to sail for six hours a day for 10 days, then they can do without getting overreached, fatigued, you know, injured from um, repetitive strain. Um, so I guess we're developing two things. We're developing an, a person who can develop a piece of technology and that's physically demanding. And we're developing an athlete that will race for a, a 40 minute race twice a day in the America's Cup. So it's quite hard to develop two people at the same time, but they're the challenges we come up against. And, um, you know, yeah, I know you spoke to Chris Toombs a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, he's doing some work at the moment about coach health and uh during one of the interviews I, I with him i said that sometimes what we do is like put, trying to put a fire out with a flamethrower you know we've we might have niggles and we might have high chronic and acute or we might have a, a high acute loading um and then the next day somebody will come along and say hey just to increase your monotony and just to increase your acute loading i want to sail again for eight hours so you basically got 10 hours to turn an athlete around, recover them. You know, we have a phrase here, what we call shotgun sports science thing. You know, you come off the water, the, <laughs> the guys are absolutely broken. They've been grinding for six hours. You've been pumping fuel into them for performance fueling. And then you get in, you go to the debrief and the coach goes, yeah, really good day. Weather looks great tomorrow. Let's do it all again. And you've got these guys that are falling asleep in the debrief and you're like, okay, guys, <laughs> let's get you some recovery going on let's do some massage let's do some deep tissue let's do um you know some mobility maybe get some um, compression or squids on you something like that you know it all depends on the individual and what their load's been but you've essentially got 10 hours okay start the clock got 10 hours they're stepping back on the boat to do another eight hours you come off the water okay yeah really good day let's do it again tomorrow <laughs> so yeah we just we call it shotgun sports science and what you've got 10 hours what can you do to get that guy ready um and sometimes you throw a load of shit at the wall and hope it sticks and sometimes you have a guy that you know what works for him and he knows what works for him and you you do those things so um the other side of that is we have some nice opportunities like right now in january we're not sailing and we have a really nice opportunity to look at our guys and periodize their workload very efficiently, making sure they're ramping up to February when we go sailing and their workload's going to go through the roof. So we started them off nice and gently and we're just picking that up every five days until their workload's high enough that they can tolerate the load that they should expect in February and March. So sometimes we have these really nice periods where we can, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men and we can have really effective strategies and then other times it's okay get the shotgun out <laughs> we're going to war i absolutely love that term you you need to copyright that really quick and <laughs> get a nickel every time somebody does it because i think more and more sports with how these rules are changing or moving towards that shotgun approach where it's, it's so many things need to be fluid and there's no real opportunity to have a 
quote unquote true plan because yeah. there's never a day that's going to be what the day is supposed to be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think, please don't take me out of context. I think periodized planning is essential and I still do it now. You know, we have a periodized plan for the year. We know what it looks like. We know where our opportunities are. But what I have learned in this sport is, especially in this sport where we're, we're absolutely, um, we're holding to the wind. You know, if the wind's blowing and the, the sea state's good, we're going sailing. And if we have an opportunity in five days to recover some guys, we take it. But if it's a good, we, we saw in the, in the last campaign that we had a weather window that lasted 22 days and we sailed every day for 22 days. And you can imagine what a human body is like. You know, it's like saying, a bit like a Tour de France rider. What do you do in the evening with a Tour de France rider? You, you've, you've got to start the stop clock and you've got to say, okay, he's got to be back. He's, got, he's swinging a leg over his bike in 10 hours. What, do we, what can we do? Well, you need to sleep. You need to eat. What can we do with those things? Well, we can make your sleeping environment as good as we can. Um, we can have a look at how many calories he's burned. We can look at his training stress score. We can have a look at his, you know, how much power he's produced that day. What does his normalized power look like? Can we get the, the, can we get the outputs in calories to the chef? You know, can we give him a, some sort of recovery shake that's, that eases that pain? Um, you know, can we measure some inflammation markers at regular spots? Yeah, well, we've got a you know, nice financial backing. So, you know, we can do some of these things. Um, and we're very lucky to be able to do so. Um, and they all inform this kind of shotgun sports science in. What can you do in the next 10 hours that, make, that can turn that athlete around and get them in the best possible position to do it all again tomorrow? And that's one of the biggest things I've learned here, um, which is that sometimes you you, you've got to rip the rule book up and throw it away and do what's right for you, right for the athlete, right for the team. Um, and that doesn't mean to say we don't have the conversations that, hey, you know, you, this guy can't, he just can't do another day like that. You know, you, you're at risk of losing him in terms of availability. Um, if we're not at risk of losing somebody in availability, then we do everything we can. If we're at risk of losing their availability, that's when we have the hard conversation with, with the coaches of say, hey, look, you know, this guy needs a definitive change or otherwise we're going to lose him for a longer period and we do have those conversations um but it's our job to keep people on the water and we do it when we can to do that i love it ben it's sensational so let me let me get you out of here on this buddy where can people find more about what you're doing where can they see what you guys are building out there and, and where can they keep up with you um well obviously you can follow us on social media we're, we're innovation sports, so a lot of our intellectual property is very important to us. And, we're, you know, you won't know a lot about what we're doing until we land in the America's Cup. But, um, you know, if you want to follow us, it's uh, Ineos Team UK on all of the, the apps. So you'll, if you type that into any search and you know, search, uh, social media, you'll find us. Um, I'm at BGW82 on Twitter. You know, I generally just kind of retweet all of the really good stuff up there, out there from <laughs> You know, Dan Roberts and Stuart McMillan and Chris Toombs and Nick Grantham and, you know, all of these kind of really exceptional practitioners that I look up to. I kind of, I'm always keeping an eye on where they're going. So if you follow me, you'll just see a retweet of what they're doing with the occasional hand grenade thrown in there just to, you know, keep keep a couple of guys on their toes. <laughs> um, but, you know, if anybody wants to kind of link up with me at BGW82 or Ben.Williams at IneosTeamUK.com, more than happy for you know people to come down and you know although we're close of our intellectual property if you want to see what we're doing in human performance department we're pretty open there's no secrets here we just try and do the basics as well as we can day after day love it brother this is absolutely sensational i can't thank you enough for spending the time with us today ben people are going to love this yeah thanks so much jay thanks for having me on and uh yeah i hope people listen <laughs> yeah yeah oh they will man this is great appreciate your time brother we'll be in touch real soon yeah thanks buddy yep cheers and a huge thanks to Ben Williams for spending the time with us today. Guys, open, honest, candid sharing from, a, from an individual who's running uh, really the program out there and, and giving us the ins and outs of how he's trying not only to continue to develop as a practitioner, but what has been driving his decision-making and what is helping him 
make sure that they're moving in the right direction consistently. I can't thank Ben enough for his open, honest, candid sharing today. Um, ben, keep up the great work, brother. This is sensational. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. As always, we are just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.